What's going on, everybody? It's your boy, Jaren, one-third of the JKF Podcast. Um, in this episode, it's a special episode, and we will be talking about something that's near and dear to us, our brother, Gerald. Um, Y'all favorite. We're not going to say that. It's not the favorite. <laughs> but what we will be talking about here is sickle cell day <laughs> put the whole chair on my toe <laughs> this <shit hurt. laughs> oh. Oh. <laughs> hurt. so yeah, Gerald what's up y'all it's y'all favorite Gerald you call me ham uh, we're doing this special little segment Keith, because June 19th is not only Father's Day Happy Father's Day to y'all, you know what I'm saying? Uh, it's not only Juneteenth, Black Power. It is also World Sickle Cell Day. And as y'all know, you should know by now, that I don't suffer, but I've been living my life with sickle cell since I was born. So this little small segment is going to be a little insight of what I've experienced, um, what people I know have experienced. And I also want to ask my two best Pals, yeah, we can't even be friends. Best pals, friends. Stop, stop crying, man. Stop crying. It's the title. About how they've experienced sickle cell from the outside looking in. Um, I don't want to. You know what? I'm just gonna do it. So sickle cell is a blood disorder. It's genetic. You get it from birth. It affects your red blood cells where they're not soft and spongy like normal people's, but they're sickle shaped like a crescent. And they're hard so when they get sticky they get stuck in your blood vessels and it causes excruciating pain like terrible um, and just like anything any part of your body that blood goes to sickle cell can affect it uh, back in 2019 I had a uh, liver transplant an emergency liver transplant because in 2018 my liver was attacked with something called cirrhosis which uh, they said the sickle cells then attacked probably like around December 28th and I was in a coma until January 2nd and during that time my family and my friends had to deal with uh, me either getting a liver um, me possibly not getting a liver and not living very long after that or uh, and I'm and I'm glad they came to the right conclusion to transplant me and you know give me a second chance at life um, but you know ever since elementary school but in grade school period, I had a hard time talking to people about sickle cell. Um, so I never really told them why I was out of school, why I was in the hospital, why I was sick so frequently. I just make up something. Um, but then I started to grow older and realize I'm not doing myself nor my community any favors by not talking about it. So probably into college and a little bit after college, I started to open up more about it. I used to talk about it on social, well, I still do talk about it on social media. Um, and everybody that's in my circle or people immediately around me know what I deal with. Uh, I made friends from it. I lost a lot of friends to it, which is really tough to deal with. Um, but it's, it's a, there's a lot of stereotypes that come with it as well. Um, you're in and out of hospitals all the time. And I'm sure you guys know that society has an issue with pain medicines, uh, narcotics or opioids. And uh, they make it, the people that are using them recklessly make it harder for us to get the pain medicine that we need to live out our day-to-day -day lives without having to be doubled over in pain or, you know, stuck under a heating pad or sitting in a warm bath and things like that. Um, it affects a lot of people. A lot of people don't have long life expectancies with it. And there's a, there's a, I can go on for a very long time. But the main thing I wanted to do today is tell you a little bit about my experience. What I'm gonna do next is ask my friends, my homies, my brethren, about how they dealt with everything when I was in a coma, on life support, stuff like that. So I'm gonna start on the end with Brother <clears throat> Maurice. And uh, can you 
can you tell me how it was when you either seen Ada's Facebook post or I'm not sure what actually happened when it first started off. Uh, for me, yeah, I did, I, I was I at work? I was probably at work, so I didn't know anything about it when it was like yeah. So Ada actually called me first. Mm -hmm. Um and I could tell in her voice something was wrong. Uh she told me Jerm in her calmest voice. They're putting Gerald on life support. I immediately started crying. I told you it was going to be tough, man. You know what, bro? Nope. Um, I immediately started crying. I had to walk away from my daughter. Um, try to get myself together. Um, and I immediately called her grandmother so I could drop her off. Then I called Mo. The boy was at home. And I remember you telling me that you passed out a little bit. And that was one of the hardest things I ever had to tell a friend. It was that our other friend that we do everything with every day it was on my support. How did you take it, Mo? Uh, pretty much the same. I, I don't know when Ada posted on Facebook or anything. This day. It was maybe the next day. Okay, so yeah. So yeah, it was the same day then. I think I had, I had just gotten home not too long before that. Um, talking to, the, to, to, to my kid's mom. Junior was a baby at that point. Yeah, uh, yeah and Jill and Jerm called. Honestly, I don't. I don't even remember what exactly Jerem said. If he if he just said it, I'm I still ain't. <laughs> but I don't even remember what he said on the phone. Hey, bro, what are you doing? You know, we don't need to talk. And I was still emotional. Mm. And uh, like, hey, man, we need to go to the hospital. They just put Gerald on life support. Yeah, and I remember just. Like pretty much like a you see this, and then I was just silent for however long, and yeah, pretty much telling her because she had never even seen me in an emotional state like that. So she like, what's like, what's wrong? What's wrong? Like, uh, it's pretty much just like uh, they said Ger Gerald is on on life support. I need to go to the hospital right now, and she uh, she pretty much like let's go. But yeah, I. It was just, it was, that's one of the hardest things to hear. Cause just hearing life support, you automatically thinking like, they not gonna make it. Right. So yeah, man, it was, it was, it was a tough drive. Yeah. I don't know if I would've made that drive. <laughs> I had no choice. I would've just stayed next to the phone or something, bro. No, I had no, to. No, you never know. Easy to say when I'm not in that situation. Oh yeah, man! Absolutely, had to make that drive, bro. Like, but it wasn't no, it wasn't no not going, bro. Yeah, because I remember everything leading up to that. <laughs> John just, what, what have you? Like your eyes was golden yeah, red, yeah, yeah. the color that might, and then the life support, and then the heart. They of course tell your friend, and then as soon as you walk into the ICU, your sisters look at me and start crying. Yeah. Like that, that's automatically I thought the worst. I'm like, oh shit, I just missed it. But um like we stood there, I got there first, Ben Mo. Um uh, just stood there and just, just watched you. Like, at one point you shook real hard and your eyes open. It was it looked scared, creepy as hell, but Carrie saw it and she jumped. Like 
That shit was scary. How close were y'all? Do y'all remember how close you were to me? We touched you, right? Y'all right? was ancient on the bed, man. That's right. Oh, like, <laughs> all, like, right next to the bed. I got it, it was so swole. Yeah. Bro. Uh, so, <laughs> yeah. And then all the right. color of the urine was like Coca-Cola. Like, it, yeah, it, it was, was dark, dark, dark. Yeah. Right. So, uh, just to let y'all know, in... In 2018, I knew my liver was kind of messed up. I was seeing the doctors. I was seeing a doctor who, who I think didn't do a good job catching it or reversing the effects of the liver disease. Um, I eventually got a new job in October at the hospital that basically saved me. Um, like three months after I started. Uh, I started like not it, even before that my eyes were like neon yellow like it was just disgusting um, I started getting like random hives my body my face my hands would just become swollen and then I remember being Christmas Christmas Eve so me and my siblings Ada and Carrie we would always spend the night at somebody's house on Christmas Eve and then go to wherever we do on Christmas at uh, and I remember being at Carrie's house and I couldn't stop my nose from bleeding like at all. I didn't know what that was. Uh, I don't really suffer from nosebleeds often. Uh, days leading up to it, I, I felt like I was just way more exhausted than I've ever been. I would come home from work, take a long ass nap, get up like at seven or eight, probably find something to eat and go back to sleep for the rest of the night until I got up at seven to go back to work. Um, and that happened days on end still dealing with like constant pain and stuff but on Christmas day after the family did the gifts and everything like that I was having sickle cell pain in my legs so I went I took myself to the ER and uh, after they did blood work they saw that a lot of my levels were ridiculous and they wanted to send me to the bigger hospital which is Cleveland Clinic main campus which is down in I ain't gonna say downtown but in Cleveland <clears throat> so I remember I remember getting loaded into the ambulance and I remember I barely remember but I remember getting there and I signed consent to get like a blood transfusion or a blood exchange when you receive another blood you gotta they gotta tell you about the risk and everything you gotta sign off on it I remember signing that and I really don't remember much like I don't remember events after that part. And I guess, I'm sure some stuff was going on that I was alert for, but I can't remember the exact day that I went on life support. Like I, you know, I, I was no longer conscious for real. Um, and that could have been days, days, after I got to main campus and got the exchange. And I remember bits and pieces of like random stuff. I remember seeing so many different doctors come in and out of my room. Uh, there was like a 10 or 20 minute video I got on my phone of <laughs> basically of like Ada's chin because I was holding my phone from the bed and there were doctors talking to her about, you know, getting a liver transplant and stuff like that. And I, I was, you know, I was responding I was saying stuff, I was cracking jokes. I don't really remember it though. Um, but that's, and then I remember one time being in some bed, I felt like I couldn't move, I couldn't talk. I know my eyes were wide open. And I remember like seeing my family and I felt like I was like that forever until I probably ended up going back to sleep or whatever the case may be. And then the only thing I remember after that is Ada waking me up telling me it was January 2nd, 2019, and I had a liver transplant. And she told me that the first thing I said was, you know, well, who do I have to thank for saving my life for real? Never in a million years would I have thought that I would have to get an organ transplant. 
a life-saving over here transplanted that. Even till today, I have like survivor's guilt. <sighs> because I lost friends to the same illness from things I would consider not as severe as a liver transplant. And you guys can, you know, you can thank God, you can say the prayers work and everything. But from my point of view, if if anything, if anything was off, if it didn't happen in 2019 and it happened in 2020 and COVID was an issue, um, if I didn't work at Cleveland Clinic, if my sister hasn't been there for 16 plus years, if I didn't go to the ER Christmas night and I waited until the next morning, it's hard to say that I would have survived, man. And I'm grateful and it's and it's, it's dope to have like a second chance, even though I didn't really feel like my first one was over. <laughs> but just <clears throat> just the years leading up to me being, you know, twenty eight, getting a liver transplant. Never, never would have thought I would have dealt with anything more severe than the excruciating pain that sickle cell gives you. Like I knew the risk, I never would have thought that it would have happened to me, especially before the age of 30. And like I said, sickle cell warriors is what we call ourselves. Warriors don't have a very long life expectancy. Things have gotten better uh, throughout the years, obviously with technology and more education that people have been receiving and stuff like that the the journey is not done because there is there's still a lot of there's still a lot of work to be done in the community for sickle cell patients and people that care for sickle cell uh, whether that's your family your friends your significant other even nurses and doctors uh, there was a lot of times where i went to the er <laughs> And I got discharged before the doctor even came in because they all, not they all, but the doctor thought I was just drug seeking because I may have been there a few days before or honestly for very other, for a lot of other stereotypical reasons. Um, sickle cell doesn't affect just African-American, it affects us mainly, but technically anybody can get it. Uh, South Americans, islands, Africans, people who have any type of lineage. Honestly, it's a genetic disorder, so even <clears throat> there's white people that have it as well. Um, it originated in Africa. Some people say it was God's way of saving people from <clears throat> malaria. But whatever. I live in America, so I ain't really got to worry about it. Um, but it just sucks because most of doctors patients that have sickle cell yes they are brown or darker skinned people and we all know ever since like tuskegee experiments uh black women having issues during childbirth black people in doctor's offices or in the hospital in general there's still a stigma there's still racism that you deal with there's still uh what's another word prejudices and it can affect your health and if if I would have succumbed to any of those issues before I could have said it I really wish my parents or my family would have went full fledged suing the pants off of whomever bro uh, and I still like have those thoughts but I'm just more fortunate and grateful that I was blessed with 
an amazing family and an amazing friends that were able to keep me uplifted when I was really down. Uh, things after the transplant, uh, I ended up having renal or kidney failure. I was on dialysis for close to six months. At one point I was on 24 hours a day dialysis. Um, I suffered multiple seizures. I had temporary loss of sight, which was wild and out of nowhere. Um, but all these things are possible because you were born with sickle cell, something that you didn't ask for, something that you didn't have sex with somebody and got, well, you didn't, your parents did. I say all this to say that there's, I say a lot, I guess. Uh, I say all this to say that you don't know the struggle, honestly. You, you don't know the struggle. And even though I'm not sure if y'all think I look all right, or I seem to be doing okay day in and day out, but there's pretty much a 50-50 chance that I'm somewhat suffering on the inside from this illness that I got as a child illness that I was born with. So if you know anybody that has sickle cell, if you if you have the trait yourself, if you have sickle cell yourself, uh, please don't hesitate to reach out to either myself, my family, or Jeremy Mo to get any type of advice or kind words, or if you need, you know, somebody to advocate for you while you're in the hospital, I'm 100% available for you all the time. There's no real way to celebrate sickle cell except for spreading awareness for it. And that's what June 19th does for us. And also September is Sickle Cell Awareness Month. So spread the word for that as well. Um, yeah, it was, it was tough to deal with. And I think for a very long time, I avoided asking you guys or pretty much anybody outside of my family, you know, what they felt, <clears throat> how they felt, how did you guys cope with all of this stuff that happened to your favorite homie, you know what I'm saying? I say favorite homie. I'm their favorite homie. Um, is, there, is there any other information or stories that y'all want to share, like, during the shit during the entire 2019 because you know I missed Carrie's wedding one of the two I missed a vacation sorry about that so, so if you don't mind fellas just give me like your side of the story it was like a well first it was like it was like a double hit because when, when she first called when, when they first called and told me that you were on life support mm -hmm. of course that's a major just Good punch, like what? Why right, you got there with that? Okay, we trying to work on trying to get ourselves together, like just for your sake, so we can keep ourselves uplifted as well. We have to also worry about your own. Don't want that stress on your own self. But a day or two later, to hear that, like, okay, he's gonna need a liver, or he not gonna make it. So now that's yeah. another, like, what? Like we already, done, he already on life support. You, but I think you had woke up at some point. Had he woke up already at some point? No. At that point, <laughs> I think he. I think he had woke up. No, he was on life support the entire time. Because he woke up to him getting it to. He did. So liver. I think. Or liver. liver yeah, liver, to liver. liver. Yeah. So okay, he was. Uh, I guess it was just getting better. It wasn't like all right, he finna go. Yeah, I didn't have that feeling like I did when the first like he on life support. Right. But then to come right back and like okay, if he don't get this, he is gonna be gone. Like. Well, that was just a. He was at work for that phone call. Yeah, that's the one I was at work for. Like, well, I, well we just went through this, right? Through this whole feeling, and it's right back a day or two later. So, um, I don't. I mean, I don't really have any other like stories or anything. But yeah, it was just it was tough. It's up. We were up there every day. <clears throat> I was up there every day. I could be. I know. I still had a. A child, child at home, so I wasn't right. able to go like daily like I normally would. But I was up there every day that I could be. And then that day when you were up, when I got there, it was just. <laughs> I yeah, remember that. Actually. I'll tell that story in a second. What about you, Jerry? Mm. 
It's definitely hard seeing you that way. Like it's been hard before. I've seen you cry before. Like, it's never a good feeling. But we've been there were times where we came to the hospital every single day, especially when we get like Lake West and yeah. uh, other hospitals. Yeah. Like we come every day. Wish, I would yeah, definitely you step up because I'm already there. And I was working at the clinic, and you was there, and I would stop in. But it was just hard visiting you, even after the surgery, still in the coma. Yeah. I put my name on the shirt. Keep <laughs> on the shirt. Kill him off. That's inside joke. Um, <laughs> So many inside jokes. Oh yeah, don't it's worry guys. We and past terrible friends. jokes to each other. Terrible friends. <laughs> terrible jokes. But they all we all know it's all in love. For sure. Yeah, that's just the way our sense of humor work. And trust me, that shit does not hurt at all. Right. And I was sitting there the day I had the shirt on, your mom didn't notice it for like a good half an hour, forty five minutes. And then she started crying. I'm like, Why are you crying? I love your shirt. You put my nigga on the shirt. So it was and then seeing you awake was was amazing. But then I think I came up, you'd leave an ICU and had to go right back because I, I sat there for that damn seizure. Yeah, uh, yeah. We were just sitting there talking uh, like regular. Yeah. You was on G G one hundred. Yep. The N nine. So that was after the transplant. That right? was after the that transplant. Was after the transplant. Yeah, yeah, transplant. Was leaving the ICU. Mm -hmm. just right we just need to turn the time off. Um you said in that G. G100? G100 bed 11. Because it was right after the next day. <coughs> and we just sitting there talking like regular. We was watching something on TV. Brian, Fracture from Jokers. And, and then um, then you started pointing to your face, and then your face dropped. And I was about to hit the cold blue, but like, no, I can't do that. So I ran to the nurse station. I, I ran into the hallway. Screaming, I need help. I need help. He's having a seizure. I need help. And you, I remember you saying when you woke up, because they put you back in the coma. Yeah. Mm -hmm. They, um, when you woke up, like I heard you yelling for help. I just couldn't do nothing. Like you, yeah. you couldn't feel your hands. And that's what you were saying. I can't feel my hands. And then you got stuck. Mm -hmm. And then you just, and you just started shaking. And the nurse is just staring at me. Like, one of you bitches get up and come help him. <laughs> He's having a seizure. And the biggest fucking nurse ran down the hallway slowly to go get a pen. They, um, I forgot whatever they gave you to try to stop the seizure. She had to go and lock it. It was all the way down the hallway. And then all the doctors came running in. Then they called the code blue. And then I see all these different teams come in. And I had to call Ada, <laughs> who had just left the hospital. Like, hey, they just had a seizure. They working on him. I don't know what's going on. So she had to go pick up your mom and come back. Yeah. Like, Nada was there nonstop. Mm -hmm. sure. Like, all fucking day. And I'm grateful to her supervisors for letting her. But, like, having to call her back, like, I, she was, I know she was so tired. Oh, yeah. And I hated to have to call, that, call her and tell her what was going on. Yeah, it was nothing else I could do but just sit there and wait for them to finish working on you. Then we walk you back down to the ICU, and yeah. you came out of it because we were telling you that we were about to put you back in the coma. Yeah. And Ada was rubbing your head. I remember the whole room, and you started crying. Like you you just did not want to go back in the coma. And <clears throat> I remember uh, Tiffany came over from her unit. Yeah, yeah. What up, Tiff? And she stood there with us for a while. And then, uh, we, me and Mo showed up. We sat, stood there with you for a minute until they started putting you back under. And they, we were saying our goodbyes, love you. And then they closed the curtain and Ada started crying. And, like that, that shit sucked. You, had, you went right back to the same room that they just pulled you out of. You, it wasn't even, wasn't even an hour. It wasn't even an hour. You might have been in that room all the 20 minutes before shit can start to going down here. All right. So I remember, I remember Ada leaving, and I remember me and you, you know, just talking, regular conversation. I don't really know what happened. I don't know what happened before that, but for me to be having a regular conversation, I thought everything was good. And then I know I was talking to you, and then, like, my voice went away, mm -hmm. and I kept trying to clear my throat first, but nothing would come out. And then I did look at you and I were pointing to my face or my throat or whatever. 
and I remember shaking and I think I remember seeing one nurse come around to the far side of my bed and then I blacked out from there. Do I remember them telling me they were going to put me back on life support though? Because they... I don't think I remember that. What was it? Or it was either life support or... Yeah, it was life support, but they didn't want your throat. Yeah. They didn't want your throat to close up. It was yeah, a short little them. white ner- uh, doctor. I remember <laughs> that. Like they don't want your throat to close up if you have another seizure. If it can close up, we just want to keep it clear. Yeah, they were trying to do me, give me a yeah. trach. Yeah, I do remember yeah. those conversations. They were yeah. trying to give me a trach, and I'm like, all right, but they never, they never tried to take you the did. tube out you to see if I can talk. No, you didn't want the trach. So and, and the other option, only other option was for them to put the tube down your throat to keep your airway clear, and then maybe you that's got emotional again. Mm-hmm. All right, so maybe I do remember that part, maybe a, a little bit, but I, I definitely remember them waking me up. I still had the tube in my throat, and they were telling me they were going to do a trach, mm-hmm. and at that point I was like, yeah, whatever. But I, then some other doctor came in. Uh, I think he was actually a really dope doctor to my family and everything like that. So I remember he came in and he was like, well, let's see if he can breathe or talk on his own. So I remember him taking the tube out my throat, which is very fucking uncomfortable, bro. Sure, bro. Um, there's, there was a lot of things that were uncomfortable. This dude. Uh, so, like, people was going on ventilators. That's what it is when you're on life support, something that breathes for you. Uh, people was going on ventilators for COVID and I'm like you you don't know what you don't know and ventilators are terrible but anyway they took the tube out my throat and I think it took me a while but I was talking and they didn't need to put the whole a trachea is when they put a hole in your throat and like I don't want to call it a straw but some type of tube that I can't remember the name of even though I worked in respiratory for a little bit (laughs) Anyway, to put that in there. And you be able to breathe from your lungs out your throat instead of out of your mouth. Yeah, yeah that was another tough call. It wasn't as much. It was still a gun clutch, but not as much as that first one. Yeah, because yeah, we knew they you would put, be okay. They put you under this one. The, sec- yeah, yeah. the second time, we knew you was going to be okay. Yeah. The first time, yeah, she was in there. It's still just a word of life support. Just yeah. Like, yeah, I bet, man. What else? That's all I want to remember. So if that was after the transplant, because there was another time they gave me the medicine to treat my liver, and that's what the but messed up my that's kidneys. Was I on life support again kidneys. after that though, right? How many times was I going on life support? Was it two times? I don't remember it was just twice. I don't remember it being two times. No, I, they gave you the medicine. That's why you needed the transplant. Because they switched the medicine around. Mm. It fixed one thing and fucked up the other. Yes, that medicine. It was yeah, after the that transplant. Was after the transplant. Yeah, but that's what, that was after that the was transplant. After, that, yeah, that, 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 but that medicine they, caused my kidneys. Yeah, after the transplant is when they fucked his kidneys up. Yeah. yeah, that medicine fucked my kidneys up. So that's when, that was in May. I remember being home after the transplant for a little bit. Um, I had the liver that I received came with a disease that I had to treat at home. I'm not going to tell you what it is. You can Google it if you want to. Um, and I was able to treat it at home, but the medicine they gave me wasn't working, I guess, to their likings or it wasn't doing a swell job. So they admitted me in the hospital a couple of days before I planned on going back to work. Actually, <clears throat> they admitted me to the hospital. They were giving me some medicine IV, but then they decided to switch it up a few days after that. And that medicine sent me into kidney failure. And I, I don't remember life support after that, man. Yeah, I don't remember you being again yeah, I don't think like so. That's when that's when 24-hour dialysis came along. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Those were some big ass bags of fluid. They poured so much water and fluid off of you. Yeah, man. And those those bags was huge. Also, when those organs stop working, you get backed up full of fluids. And I remember having a very hard time standing up. I remember my skin was super stretched out, and I was over like 300 pounds. And then dialysis took me all the way down to like 150, I believe. Yeah, maybe 130. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, something real small. And in between that time, I lost a lot of muscle and a lot of muscle mass. And that I need to, even three years afterwards, I still need to build that up. 
the first year or two, the first year of recovery was still very hard. You still have to. No, yeah, it was so fucking tough. It was so much stuff going on because I had to go to physical therapy to learn how to walk again. Uh, I couldn't breathe, and it hurt so fucking much to stand up and take steps. And it, I was there for a while before. Oh, they would flush my metaport, or they would flush my catheter, and it would make me go into, uh, make me tacky, tacky carter, whatever it is. And I had to get admitted to the hospital a few times after that. It was it was just so much stuff going on, man. Didn't you have pneumonia from that? Probably. It was so much shit, bro. Because between the two seaters that I had, the renal failure, there was congestive heart failure because of the catheter stuff I guess. I remember even being able to like feel my heart palpitate. Um the dialysis when they would flush my port. Dialysis also sucks, but four hours of you laying there and your body getting exhausted because they're literally taking blood out of you, running it through a machine to wash it and put it back in you. I felt like crap after that. I even feel like crap after the blood exchanges that I get now. It was a rough year, man. And even now, it's just a second chance of life, yes. You really, I can't, like, I can't pick up where I left off at. Everything is different. I'm still getting used to the way my body works or reacts to certain things. There's a lot of foods that I can't eat now. There's a lot of, uh, activities that I can't do I'll be taking some sort of medicine for the rest of my life and the toughest thing I feel like I still that I've dealt with throughout the entire thing is literally the emotions that everybody had to deal with dealing with me going through that shit bro. that's probably the most painful thing like listening to y'all tell your stories and crying Listen to my family stories. Seeing my family cry when, when I couldn't speak, but I was like alert. That's that was the worst part. And all of that shit stemmed from an illness that can mess you up in any any fucking turn of life, bro. Uh, well, just saying about like this, this is before, well before. Like, did you ever have any issues like with friendships early on? Like, like just growing up, did you ever not not want to make friends because of your issue, your your sickle um, cell or not growing up? No, I like I had friends. I was when I was younger, I was able to do a lot more activities than what I can do now. I was able to, you know, play football in the street. I was able to hoop every day. Um, still get, like, I would still get winded before everybody else did and stuff like that. But other than that, I was pretty much like a healthy kid. Um, they treated me as if I had asthma just so I didn't, you know, get fucked up if I was short of breath. I don't know what to do, basically. Mm -hmm. And, like, during childhood, the only things, not the only things, but I dealt with a lot of pneumonia, which is fluid on your lungs, makes it hard to breathe, causes infections and shit like that. And the pain crisis. <laughs> it's not, it's not funny. But uh, there's this thing that sickle cell warrior, male sickle cell warriors deal with called priapism. Uh, like in the Viagra commercial, tell you if your erection long, lasts longer than four hours and seek medical attention, that's basically what it is in sickle cell form with pain so uh, I experienced that in my early teenage years it was always early in the morning I think I've only had to go to the ER maybe two or three times I probably experienced it maybe less than ten times the thing that I if there's anybody who 
has children that might deal with it. The things that helped me out was, and it's uncomfortable, but it's very helpful. Uh, jumping rope and riding my bicycle. Whatever it took to obviously get the blood flowing around you, around your penis area, <laughs> uh, was it, it helped and it'll eventually go down. You just gotta, you know, stay hydrated and get your blood moving. Sometimes, like when they, when you're not able to treat it at home and you do have to go to the ER, it's very unpleasant. Uh, but the relief is, the relief is worth it. Uh, but sorry, man, to get off the track. But I never really had an issue making friends. I had an issue telling friends about my illness. That's what I was wondering, like, just, yeah, once they knew. Because I, I guess when you're younger, you probably wouldn't yeah. say as much. But I thought, yeah, maybe once you got a little older and there was more of a thing that you had to deal with, even though you had to deal with it again young, I guess it got worse. It did say, get worse. As you got, got older. Yeah. So I guess you would. I was just wanting it to be hard to be like, because I'm always back and forth in the hospital. I don't even want to have to involve you with those feelings or having to know that I'm back in and out of the hospital for whatever reason. Yeah. So I got some friends maybe had some, uh, had trouble making, not making friends, but yeah, just wanting to make new friends. Yeah. Don't be, not with people around me, not with like school or neighborhood homies. I didn't really start making sickle cell friends until I was probably like a teenager and then into my twenties when like social media came about and I started following hashtags or seeing who was talking about sickle cell and oh, your story is similar to mine and then we become friends. Uh, the issue with that was it was it's amazing. There's a lot of incredible warriors out there. All of our stories are different and we all relate. The issue is losing them. That's the biggest issue. Making friends that have sickle cell. And then losing them to sickle cell when it could be easily you. Yeah, that sucks. Um, but even like now, It's been a while since I met somebody new, like face to face, real life, at least after the transplant. Mm -hmm. um, because like during the transplant, when Ada was posting on Facebook, there was a lot of love I was receiving. Um, had his own hashtag. <laughs> yeah, that was pretty dope. Uh, there was a lot of love I was receiving and I th thought things would change socially but it did. So, uh, a lot of friends that I haven't heard from where I wasn't like close with, I became close with, they were checking on me. We would still have like a normal conversation. And probably after recovery, I didn't hear from a lot of them again. Uh, and I, I'm, not, I'm not really sure what I should have expected. You know what I'm saying? It was a it was basically a grieving point. People wanted to check in, make sure that I was good and stuff. And after they found out that I was good, you know, we go back to our our lives, right? I wasn't in your life before. So why did I think, I don't know. It was very, even though I always had support, it was very lonely. So there was nobody that could like relate. And as the circumstances got worse, I guess that's pretty much it, man. It's not it, but we're gonna wrap this part up so we can get to the the best part of today. The real JKF podcast. Yeah. We ain't gonna be crying tears unless it's from laughter. Cause I'm so funny. Look at me. You're not the funniest? Cause that's me. Oh, that's me. For sure. Y'all got any other questions? Uh, Well, the years. Uh, I'm gonna try to, I'm gonna try to drop this one on Sunday. See so y'all can 
have something to listen to on World Sickle Cell Day. Um, yeah, be out. I appreciate you guys listening. If you, ooh, I should have had like a website or something y'all should go to. Uh, but don't do that. Just reach out to me and I can tell you more about my story. I can tell you more about Sickle Cell. I can help you advocate, whether it's for your family, your friends, or for yourself. Uh, whether you're in the emergency room, whether you're admitted in the hospital, it's already bad enough that you're dealing with pain, but to deal with bullshit on top of it doesn't make it any better. Um, so I'm here for you. Again, thank you if you made it this far. Thank you very much for listening. I hope you enjoy your Juneteenth. Hope you enjoy Father's Day and find a way to spread love on World Sickle Cell Day. Maybe we could put the website in the description when we uh, yeah. go and post it. Yeah, we post so we'll it. Give some information. It'll be up here somewhere, probably. Appreciate y'all. Uh, uh, I'm Gerald or Ham to you. <laughs> it's your boy Jerry. No. Grease. And we are JKF.